Thank you for joining us. My family and I started Bring Change to Mind 10 years ago to end the stigma and discrimination surrounding mental illness. Our mission was simple, to start the conversation. We've worked to promote open conversation ever since. From depression to bipolar disorder to post-traumatic stress, mental illness affects one in four adults and one in five children. We simply need to talk about it, dispel ignorant, destructive myths, and create empathy. Too many people are afraid to seek help. Bring Change to Mind creates safe and stigma-free peer-to-peer high school clubs where students learn about mental health, to listen and support each other, and are given the tools for self-care and wellness. Over the coming weeks and months, students will be reintegrating with their peers and returning to campuses for the first time in 14 months. We can help them and ourselves by listening without judgment, by starting and continuing courageous, supportive conversations in our home and with our friends. Tonight's discussion is an opportunity to address how mental health intersects with other critical issues that face our society. You will hear authentic and candid conversations. Our goal is to show that everyone deals in one way or another with mental health because we're human. My family and I have learned that where there is conversation, there is hope. For being with us tonight, Thank you. Hello, I'm Janine Rubenstein. I'm host of People Everyday Podcast and editor at large at People. And I am very happy to be with you all. Bring Change to Mind is a national organization working to open dialogue around mental health through PSA campaigns, high school clubs, and peer support for young people, all of these things, and in creating conversations just like this one today. So January 1st, 1983 is considered to be the birth date of the internet as we know it. And over the last 30 plus years, our lives have become increasingly digital. While the baby boomer generation is the last to know a life without household computers, social media platforms, and podcasts, the rest of us are in uncharted territory with a relatively small amount of research on the effects of digital life on mental health. And after living through a global pandemic, we have plunged even further into cyber living, and it's more than ever before. Today, I'm speaking to a fascinating group of people, artists, activists, and influencers with a strong presence in the digital space. Founder of Adam and Matter, author and content creator, Bethany Moda, Chris Olson and Ian Paget, TikTok stars who've become synonymous with the platform and recently nominated for the first ever TikTok Glad Queer Advocate of the Year Award, multi-platinum recording artist and actress Jordan Sparks, and actress, activist, and entrepreneur Allison Stoner. On behalf of People, I am so happy to be here with you all today and with all of you at home. <laughs> so guys, okay. This is just going to be a conversation where I want you to be open and and just share your experiences uh, because we are all dealing with this right now. I, I mean, this is coming from a person who, uh, you know, met her husband on Facebook and now I'm raising a, a six-year-old who just asked me for a cell phone. So, I, I, you know, just being in this world, there, there's so much to, to dig through and, and figure out. And I'm so excited to hear from from you guys. So these questions, I'm going to throw them up. You know, some, some of them I'll direct to one of you. I want everyone to feel free to weigh in and just, and just share their story. So uh, let's start with how has your online presence impacted your personal life and mental health? I'm, I'm going to take this over to Bethany, someone who we have watched for so long on social media and, and YouTube. Um, how has it affected you in that mental space? Um, wow. So many ways. I think right now I'm 25 and I started making YouTube videos when I was 13. Um, so needless to say, I got into it at like kind of those crucial years where you're really like, you know, developing who you are as a person and figuring out what you like, what you don't like your identity essentially. And social media played a huge role in that, I think in negative and positive ways. 
One of the positives being that growing up, I was always very shy. Like I was so scared to share my opinion and I was so afraid of people not liking me that it very much dictated all of my actions, especially socially. So starting YouTube was kind of like, first of all, a step that no one thought I would take. Like I remember friends and family were like, she talks like what? <laughs> and it was so out of field for me. And, and it was very scary at first, but I credit so much of getting out of that shyness to social media because I really put myself in a position where I was vulnerable. And in the beginning, I kind of dealt with a lot of, um, you know, worrying about the criticism because obviously when you're so young and you're putting yourself out on social media, there's a lot of people that can be negative and can have, you know, a negative opinion about you. And so I dealt with that for a few years of just, you know, not letting those opinions get to me and dealing with, um, you know, physical insecurities and all of these different things. And in the moment, although it was difficult, I think that it has really shaped me into the person that I am today. And I thank social media so much for that. So I think there can be a lot of negative sides because obviously people are more likely to say hurtful things when they don't have an identity and, and, and it's anonymous versus in real life. Uh, but I think you can rise through that and also find, you know, take the positive and leave the negative. You can really have a very positive outcome. For sure, for sure. So I want to I want to kick that over to Jordan uh, because you know you have this level of celebrity um, already, and then you have to tack on what the, the requirements, the the needs of social media. I mean, yeah. there's, there's teams behind it for for some people, but it still has such a, an effect on your life as a star already. So so what has that experience been like for you? It's actually been really crazy. And Bethany, you brought up a lot of great points on the fact that it negatively and positively impacted my life. Um, I made YouTube videos for fun before Idol and stuff like that, just stuff with my friends and my brother and, and things like that, but not ever thinking like anybody is going to watch this, you know, <laughs> like no one's going to do this. Um, and then American Idol happened and all of a sudden, everybody was looking at my name and it was really crazy. American Idol at the time um, during my season was in its peak. We had 33 to 35 million people watching every single night, twice a week. And um, it was really, really insane. So then jumping from Idol and going in into the music industry, it was different because we didn't have social media. It was just blog sites. You know, it was, it was just the blog and they were like, don't go on the internet, stay off of it and don't Google yourself. And I Googled myself once and I never did it again. <laughs> I never did it again. I was just like, what is happening? Um, so it was really insane just to see all the opinions. Like Bethany said, you know, I was like, dang, everybody wants to talk about what I'm doing or what I'm singing or what I was wearing or what Simon said. And um, it was, it was a lot. I feel like since then, I've definitely grown. You have to have a thick skin when you put yourself out there and you can be vulnerable and do all of those things, but you still have to be able to like, let it just kind of slide right off your back, you know? <laughs> um, and that comes at different times for, for different people. Some people it develops over time. Some people are just naturally like that. Um, but it's definitely been interesting. I think now at this point, I, every time somebody's like, Hey, don't forget to post. And I'm like, Oh God, oh. like I forgot, I forgot again. It's more than it's more a pressure than it is fun for me now at this point in my life. It's more of a pressure, more apps keep getting developed. I'm like, I don't need another app on my phone. I don't need another app to learn. I'm, I'm already behind y'all, Chris and Ian, you got to help me on TikTok. I'm just like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> so it, it can be, um, it's amazing because I get to have that connection with my fans and I get to reach out to them and, and tell my stories and share things about my life that maybe might inspire or encourage somebody else. And then on the other hand, it's like, Oh, I don't want to post this today. I don't want <clears throat> to, just like my son, I don't want to do it. <laughs> so, you know, it's a daily balance, but um, I, I am grateful. It can be, it can be very beautiful and life-changing and it can bring so many people together. And on the other side of things, it can be very devastating just to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love you, you read the trajectory of the internet because it has, like I said, I, I, my husband poked me on Facebook. If you remember what poking is, he poked me on Facebook. That's how we met. 
And now we're moving on to a world of that is dominated by TikTok. So, I mean, Chris and Ian, talk to me a little bit about you being in that space and, and, and how it's affected you as a couple, because that's a whole different ball of worms to deal with. Uh, so, so what has that been like for you? I think it's really interesting also just being on this panel because we have three other beautiful people who I'm like such a big fan of who have been in this space for so long. Jordan, I made my entire family vote for you when you were on American Idol. <laughs> Thank you. And call in. You were my American Idol. But um, so it's Thank so you. just like, <laughs> You know, being here and being in the Zoom now and being where we are and just kind of emerging into this space because of quarantine. We downloaded TikTok because we had nothing to do and we were bored in quarantine. And then life took off and completely changed. And I feel like I've, in our time here, I've learned so much from people like Bethany who have been in this space for years and know kind of how to navigate, you know, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't get easier to receive hate on the internet, but kind of know how to navigate it with a little more grace and space and know who the people are who are coming at you. And I think it's really just been a, a huge learning experience and also trying to remember that we have each other in this um, when people come at us, but then it gets tricky when people come at us and comment on our relationship and are like, after a 30 second video, I can tell that he is doing that and that I'm, I'm, I'm an online therapist and I know that he is gaslighting in that way and you are not receiving. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but it is so interesting as the point that Bethany made before is a lot of these people who comment sometimes are blank accounts, which are accounts that were made to comment in that way. and. Sometimes what, what I have found helps me the most in those situations is literally having sympathy and holding space for them and thinking what pain you must be going through in order to project that onto me. Because if I label them as bad, then I still intrinsically feel a little bit bad about myself through their comment. So that's, that's been some of my experience. And it's, it's a learning experience. Like if I get a hate comment tonight, I'll still probably be upset about it. But it's where we're, we try to, you know, having space for myself too, and knowing that it's okay to still be affected by them sometimes. Allison, I, I want to pick up on some of that with you. Uh, when it comes to bullying, which is something that has, you know, been talked about for, for years now and has ballooned into its own animal when you think of the digital age and social media, um, it, of course, has a significant impact on mental health. So so tell me a little bit about your story and, and your interaction with social media and, and, and how that has affected you. So... I started working in entertainment at six years old in the traditional sense, and I was both human and product, uh, artist in training and boss before I was double digits. And then with the entry point of social media, there was a pressure and expectation to transfer that and start building your own content, which is a very different skill. And you'll notice there's a generation of traditional performers who did not adapt and who may or may not be um, figuring out how to navigate it now. Um, it has its own culture, its own features, um, and it it's a different kind of skill. So obviously having an online presence where people not only have a front row seat into your personal life, but who can also directly reach out and express their opinions, it, it really magnifies the areas of my personality and psyche that are fragile and vulnerable to criticism, um, that are prone to being ego-driven, uh, that are preoccupied with pleasing others, uh, that are totally immersed in society's narratives about status and success. So it's been very evident that in order to find stability and grounding, I really need to learn some therapeutic skills, some true tools that keep things in perspective. And to many of everyone else's points around having this unexpected responsibility to know how to manage, 
not everyone has that capacity. And so there has to be grace for people in the public eye, knowing we are not experts on every issue, but there's an expectation for us to speak as if we are. And so humanizing both the trolls who we try to leave nameless, as well as the celebrity who we try to make uh, unattainable or unapproachable, we kind of have to bridge that gap, I think. And and social media can do that if we're willing to be authentic and we're truly willing to to listen to each other and dignify each other's experiences. <laughs> Woo. I got chills, Allison. I got chills. You better speak. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm gathering what everyone else is saying. I'm like, okay, I think this is it. <laughs> Therapeutic methods. I'm gonna look. Thank you for that. <laughs> Do it. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna toss this one up to to anyone who wants to weigh in. Um, when it comes to community, uh, I get a sense from you guys that you are able to establish and create a community. And there are some really positive communities on social media. And then also it can be an isolating place at the same time. So can anybody speak to um, just the sense of community? Maybe it's not even with their followers, just personally that you found on social media or, or in, in on the internet in general. And then also if you have felt isolated by the internet before. Isolation. Um, I, I guess I'll start. I guess with um, feeling like there is a sense of community uh, as an, uh, from an artist. I'll take it from an artist perspective. It's um, it's really cool to be able to post something and know that there's a group of people who are going to be so ready to cons to to not consume. I don't want to use the word consume. Um, there is there's a group of people who are going to be so ready to watch or look or um, be a part of and become interactive with whatever it is I'm going to post next. And that's a really cool feeling. Cause it's like, Oh, I know they're going to love this. I know my fans are going to love this, even though they could be all the way in Malaysia, they could be all the way in Africa. They could be here. They could be wherever. And the amazing thing about the internet and social media is that they can all be in one spot all together and see it at the same time. I mean, if they're if they're awake. Um, <laughs> but it's really cool to be able to have that. And on the other side of things, the isolation, sometimes for me, like what Allison said, how it like exposes the things that we have and, and our vulnerabilities. So comparison is the thief of joy. Let me just put that out there. Comparison is a thief of joy. I have to remind myself of it every day because sometimes I'll be scrolling just, you know, mindlessly looking through something like, oh, let me just catch up and see what's going on. And, you know, I'll see something or another artist and I'll just be like, dang, I really got to do A, B, C, and D. Or how am I going to do that? How am I supposed to get there? How am I supposed to do this? Where does she get that outfit? How am I going to be at that outfit? <laughs> you know what I mean? All the, all the different things that, that go into it. And then also once I start going that way, I can feel myself spiraling and feeling the anxiety and feeling the nobody understands what I am feeling at the moment. And then that is when I start to feel very isolated. And it's when I start to compare myself against what I'm seeing. And um, I think with that, I think that's also why it's become a pressure to me because every time I open it, I have to be like really quick. I have to just do it really quickly and then be done so I can focus on other things. Um, but last year was crazy. We all had ample amounts of time and there were, we were all trying to figure out what we were going to do to entertain ourselves. And it's right here, you know, it's right. It's so easy to just get into it and you look up and you've been looking for two hours. So it's, it's definitely a really crazy thing, but I have, I have felt that. And I also appreciate the community of people who are not only content creators and the fans and the community that are there that are speaking up about it and like, Hey, we're human, just like the rest of you. And that was what social media, I think, was supposed to be at the beginning, was being able to get a peek into the lives of people that we know, and we love, and we adore. And now it's just kind of become its own monster. <laughs> it's a nice, fluffy monster. It's like Sully on a, on a good day. And then it's like uh, the, the teacher in Monsters University on, on a bad day, where you're just like, oh, Oh God. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it, it can definitely be a lot, but I have felt that isolation before. And unless you have somebody who can really help pull you out of it or something that, um, you know, pulls you your happy place for, for example, 
um, it can get really tough. And sometimes you can be stuck there for longer than you mean to be. Yeah, I'm wondering, Bethany, what your thoughts on that are, especially when it comes to some of the things that Jordan brings up about um, beauty and comparison and to be in that space um, and to be uh, just a, a, a strong voice, a curator in that space. You yourself behind the scenes, do you ever deal with some of that, that isolation, that comparison, that, you know, all of that? Absolutely. When Jordan was speaking, I was just like, girl, that's it. That's it. Because that was, um, I feel like something that I have, you know, gone through a lot in my social media career so far, very much in like the comparison, like that whole thing I've experienced. And I know so like everybody has experienced it at some point. And in the YouTube space specifically, um, one thing I've had to overcome, which is also kind of under the umbrella of comparison, but it's like competition and competing. So like, obviously, if you're in a certain category, whether you're a YouTuber, Instagram influencer, TikToker, there's you have peers that do exactly what you do. So sometimes it's hard to not feel like, well, why do people want to watch this person and not me? We're doing the same thing. I have to be better. And there have definitely been times that I've gotten so caught up in that where I found myself looking at my peers more than I was focusing on my craft. Mm. And I found myself making decisions in my craft fully based on being better than or being on top. And then there were points also in my career that people would have considered me on top or like one of the very top. And I was so unhappy at that point. Like at that point, I was so afraid of losing being on top that I wasn't even enjoying it. And I wasn't even thinking about, I didn't give it the credit that it deserved of like, I should be grateful that I have this voice to talk to millions of people. But instead, I was just so worried about losing the millions of people. Um, so I think that's where it can get a little bit tricky. And I'm grateful that I went through that because now I know that the numbers are just numbers. And if you can make a difference in one person's life, I know everyone says it, but it's really so meaningful. Like I've done meet and greets where I get to meet one person that is coming up to me in tears that I've impacted them through doing something that I didn't think was that impactful. Um, and I think that's what it's really all about. And when you focus on that, it's easy to forget about the numbers and, you know, competing. If anything, if you want to compete, just compete with yourself in the past of like, I want to do better than what I put out last. Like I want to do a better video than that. I want to do a better project and keep evolving because that's always going to feel the most rewarding Allison, I'm wondering, uh, what is some advice that you would have for just younger generations who are dealing with all of these pressures on social media? Uh, it, it's, it, it's so much on their plate. Like even us here, like, you know, I, I said my six-year-old, he, he wants a phone. Like there's just a whole new generation coming up in this world. And, uh, and we know, we know that there can be these, these hidden issues and, and problems um, from bullying to, you know, wanting to compare yourself, all of these things. So, so what advice would you give just younger people in how to navigate this, this wild, wild west of, of the internet? <laughs> yes. Thank you for asking. And also thank you everyone for your honesty. It's been really so meaningful to feel like I can feel you through this conversation. Um, I just want to circle back to the previous question briefly. In the traditional artist or actor space, for example, there's a concept called de-rolling. After you leave set, you have some sort of aftercare where you actually take off the mask of the character you're playing. Now, most people in the social media space are not introduced to these formal, helpful tools because the blurred lines are truly that blurred. Is it real? Is it artifice? Are we performing or expressing from the inside out? So I just want to comment that it would be worth creating conversation around helping people who have social media presences understand, hey, like you are an artist just like artists on stage at concerts, there's a, a need to de-roll at the end of the day or after you you call cut. Um, and then to the point of creating communities online versus feeling isolated, I was trying to think as people were speaking about what exact qualities lead to isolation versus community building. And I thought, you know, 
when you're trying to get quick attention, you often simplify language. And when you simplify language, you tend to lose depth and nuance. And then if the algorithms tend to push whatever content is most um, eye-catching, which tends to be shock value, drama, you start to lose these fuller conversations about the quieter, more boring everyday moments. And then there's this concept of authenticity of like, are you being real or are you kind of creating a persona? So I think if we want to create community-driven social digital spaces, we might want to think about what it means to create opportunities for depth, for authenticity, and being able to focus on a topic for more than 0.8 seconds. Um, scrolling has really retrained our brains there. Um, so in terms of advice for younger people, I would love to reframe this whole fiasco. <laughs> um, <laughs> instead of viewing social media and technology as a replacement for real life interaction or an escape from reality, how could they be tools that enhance and enrich a deeper mind body being connection with yourself, with others, with the world? How can we be curious and, and allow ourselves to be inspired by the positive potential for social progress, for new ways of spreading information quickly, for building authentic friendships. You know, we're all co-creators of the future. And so if we have a vision for how we can use social media in a positive way, we actually will shape what it becomes. It'll change how we use the features. And then the companies who build the platforms will go, oh, no one likes this thing about trolling, but they really love when we're supporting each other meaningfully. Hmm. Let's boost this. So just remembering our power individually and collectively, I think, is is my advice. I love that. I love that. And, and you're speaking about the, the community forming. It reminds me of what um, the Black Lives Matter movement was able to do over this past year and take social media and use it in a, in a way that really brought people together physically. Um, so that it kind of speaks to you, like using it to enhance your actual life and your, and your activity. Um, I, I love that. Uh, do you guys? Um, oh, I need your class. I need to whatever uh, class you are you teaching, know, right? Allison, I will be front row. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I'm wondering, how does everyone plan to reintegrate? into real life, into society. I mean, we are uh, knock on wood coming up on, you know, things completely opening back up and, and everyone being vaccinated. Um, have you thought about ways to um, just uh, get back out there? I've seen some Saturday Night Live spoofs about like how awkward it's going to be when we actually hang out with our friends again. <laughs> but um but I guess, like, first, pl first, any big plans? Any, any thoughts on, you know, getting back to the old normal? <laughs> <laughs> what, what about you, Allison? What, what are your first big plans for for getting back out there? Well, I am an introvert, and I am prone to anxiety. Therefore, I plan to plan ahead before any social engagements. And I'll probably need an aftercare plan for that as well. Like decompress. Okay, 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 okay. You did it. You saw someone. You gave them a side hug. Um, and to be honest, I've actually found a lot of um, purpose in having this time inside. Um, I, I think naturally my appreciation for the outside world, for nature, for social connection has just skyrocketed. So there is probably going to be a very deep gratitude and I'll probably be very easily excitable. <laughs> so, you know, sorry if you encounter me and I'm like, it's so great to see you. <laughs> um, but I think I'm, I'm going to ease into it because too much too soon can be counterproductive for for a mind and body like mine. <laughs> How about everyone else? <laughs> oh yeah, Bethany, tell me, is it going to be like a one-on-one -on -one lunch type thing or like full-on rager? Like I got to get out there. 
<laughs> Definitely no rages for me. I'm also very introverted. So like the beginning of quarantine, I was very, it was very much my dream world. Like I really, that was like, this is all I want. I don't have to go to parties. I've only wanted this throughout my entire life. So, you know, the first half was really nice for me, but then it did reach a point where I was like, okay, I'm an introvert and I want to get out. Um, and obviously, you know, we couldn't, it got to the point, like my boyfriend and I went on a hike at one point and I was like, do you see those trees? Like I was just nature. So I feel like I'm going to be, you know, very excited to just get outside more and just kind of see people here and there. Definitely baby steps for me, but all in all, I think as Allison said, I will also probably be overly excited because I think it's just made all of us really appreciate, you know, the little yeah. things that we took for granted before socially and just physical contact with giving a hug, like the amount of times I've wanted to just give someone a hug the past year is crazy. So I think definitely appreciating those things as we're able to slowly but surely do those things again. Yeah. And, and Ian and Chris, you guys kind of have everything you need at home, but <laughs> I'm wondering, what about you? What are, what are the plans? I think it just like kind of goes back to the sense of community we all talked about before and finding your community online. But I think like naturally after quarantine went on for a while, it became a bit isolating. And what if you found a great community online, that was amazing, but we were all missing the feeling of community in person. So my hope is that, um, you know, people in general are, are kind of ready to start forming that community again, because we saw such an interesting thing happen when we were all online. There were a lot of things that came to light socially. And I think a lot of like communities broke apart in a way and trying to trying to rebuild in a much healthier way, the sense of community that we had from before, but evolve it into what kind of community can we have in person now? And once again, we're very new in the space. So we've never really like, we, we have, you know, when we're out to coffee, people come up to us here and there and say like, we're, we're big fans, but like we've, we've only ever had the people who send love through our phone. So I think one thing we're both excited about is being able to really connect with some of those people in person for the first time. We've just kind of become familiar with over quarantine. Um, and I think that's, that's plays into the fact this, the sense of building community with us and the positivity we want to surround ourselves with. Just make sure you look over your shoulder whenever you're getting back in your car to drive home. Okay. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> just to, just to like piggyback on that. There was a moment I was in Florida last week visiting family and I hung out with some friends who were like, Oh, we're going to go to a birthday party. And we went to an establishment in South Beach and like, it's wild. They're like, they've always, it's, it's been like, as though COVID's never happened. Um, but obviously we're in a place now where, you know, if you're vaccinated, it's different, whatever. But um, I saw some people who recognized me and fans and like, they were having a good time. And so they were very <laughs> aware of their energy and I was sober and I was just like just showing up and like this wasn't even my gathering I'm, I'm a guest you know what I mean and uh. and it had been my first interaction with like a public group setting in a while yeah. so I'm already just like this is it the anxiety of like this is weird this is like a lot of people like we're outside but like okay like you'll be okay and the sort of the belligerent love that they were showing was just like a little scary because they feel like they know you, you know, they're like, Oh, you're in my, you're in my living room with me every day. You have been for a year. I know how you talk. I know your relationship, you know, like they think they know you. And so there was this one moment and I, it just was really funny. Like it was a Rachel moment. They're like, Oh my God, like, Kim, how are you? And I was like, I'm good. How are you? And they're like, where's Chris? Are you, are you fighting? Like, did you guys break up? Because he like, wasn't with me in this moment. And that's <laughs> oh, no. That like identity crisis for me has been another thing to like grapple with. Uh, on a like a geeky note, Ian and Chris, I don't know if you're familiar with the term parasocial relationships, but that's what describes fan and artist or people who sense that they know you. It might be worth googling. Sure, um, parasocial. I love your term. Yeah, 
parasocial relationships. And there is such a thing as touch deprivation, which we have all experienced to some degree this past year. Yes. Yes. Just providing the definitions and the words and the glossary for all of this conversation. I love this, Allison. Okay, I have some rapid fire really quick for you guys. Um, telehealth was has been really big, and we're talking about mental health and how we've been taking care of ourselves. Uh, just, just down the line, have you guys taken advantage of telehealth, and, and do you think you're going to keep it up um, when it comes to things opening back up and we're able to actually see doctors again, or you're going to you know, keep doing your, your, your Zoom check-in? Oh, what's what you, I? Oh, Bethany. Oh, oh, no, 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 go, go. I. What's been great is I. So, uh, little <laughs> in 2019, I went to a treatment center for a year for drug and alcohol addiction, and I worked with a therapist that entire time. And what's been great about this time is one, we reconnected because I came up on her for you page on TikTok. We ended up FaceTiming and just catching up, and I started doing telehealth therapy with her again. For the past year, so I've been able to, re- and, and and she's in Florida, so there's there's usually that would not be able to happen, but to be able to do telehealth with her, with a therapist who knows me inside and out from that full year together, I think that has been an absolute like breakthrough of the year, and I totally plan on working with her. Obviously, for other doctors, I'm going to go back in person, but to continue working with. You know, someone who really knows my heart, I think, has been so special about this time, for sure. I I haven't used any of the telehealth um, resources. I will say therapy is the best thing that I ever did. Um, I would encourage everybody to go and find somebody that they can just talk to and get the stuff out. Um, cause it creates space for so much, so many other beautiful things to come to you, you know? Um, but I... My silly self, I did not use telehealth last year to talk to my therapist. I should have. I didn't. And I just went back to see her uh, in person for the first time uh, last month. And I was like, why didn't I call you? Like, why? <laughs> it would have helped me so much. But I, I don't know why I just didn't pick up the phone because I, I think she offered FaceTime stuff even before um, mm-hmm. lockdown and all that. And I, I just didn't even think about it. But mm-hmm. now that I've seen her, I realized even in my physical body how much I was holding. Like, my back has been giving me issues. And that's definitely the support system of your body. And I wasn't feeling support. And I wasn't feeling supported and I went and I spoke to her and I just, well, that two hour session, just let, let it all go. I let it all fly. And when I tell you after I left that session and I walked home, I woke up the next morning and my back was normal, like w- normal for what I have to deal with. I was just like, I can't believe it took me that long to just do that. And all I had to do was pick up the phone. So I would encourage everybody who's watching this right now, if there's something that you need to talk about and you don't feel like there's someone in your immediate space that you can talk to, there are telehealth um, resources and professionals that you can talk, you can ask questions, you can um, say the things that you need to, to say and the things that you need to get asked for advice. Um, I would recommend and encourage you to, to, to take advantage of that stuff because it really does help. And how about you, Allison? I'm a big fan of therapy. Mm-hmm. I have been utilizing telehealth services, two in particular, in addition to my regular therapist appointments, I downloaded Talkspace. And I also am a strong proponent of Violet. And Violet is a queer competent and culturally competent healthcare provider uh, platform. So people who can actually identify with your lived experiences and who are qualified and sensitive to your unique needs, as opposed to looking for some sort of therapist who may or may not understand your unique attributes and identity markers. So big proponent, if you're looking for someone and you're like, I don't, I don't feel safe typically in certain spaces. Violet is, I know the founder Grong and he's a stand up human and, um, and then talk space has been really helpful as well. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Last one, favorite app and why we're doing this rapid fire. Let's start with Allison favorite app and why. Pass. I'll go back. <laughs> Jordan, Jordan. Uh, my favorite app at the moment, this is going to sound so crazy, but the New York Times crosswords. 
I love doing crossword puzzles. So it's not even a social media app. That's my favorite. It's crosswords. It helps me zone out, makes me feel peaceful. It reminds me of my grandpa, my poppy. So yeah, that one's my favorite. What about you, Chris and Ian? Oh my God. I mean, I... I am in a place right now where like, I'm not really loving being on the phone as much. Like, as you saw blurred lines, like just where I'm at, like, but, um, so Netflix and like, like a, a streaming system, like for me, like I love watching like scripted things, like things that like bring a sense of nostalgia. So like any of the movie stuff, um, make me feel better is essentially, or a video game. We just got a Nintendo switch. So like, that's like a real app. Send and me I, your friend code. We gonna play. Send oh me your God. friend code. <laughs> yes. Um, like literally spent 36 hours like obsessed with beating a game and I beat it yesterday. So like, Sending me like <laughs> videos of how excited he was that he just beat it. Yeah, like that was out. Yeah. yeah. I'd say like it's a love-hate relationship, but I really do love some of the people I've connected with over TikTok. I think that has just been, it's it's both love and hate. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then Bethany, favorite app and why? Um, probably Pinterest. It's been one of my favorites for years. And also in the past year, I've decided to start cooking more as I'm sure a lot of other people have. And Pinterest has been my place. I just like find all the recipes. I look at like the one with the highest rating and then I just attempt to make it. And it's also just like a stress reliever for me, like creating a new board. If I'm stressed out, I'm just like, I'm going to make a new board today and just pin different fun things that inspire me. It's also helped me a lot creatively. Um, so that's probably my favorite app right now. Nice. Well, you guys, thank you so, so much for, for talking through all this and being so candid and open. Uh, we at People, we have a, a an initiative called Let's Talk About It. Um, it's People's Mental Health Initiative. And I'm just so happy to be on here with you all and just exposing what is really going on and, and what we're living through in this this these wild times and the digital age. So I just appreciate all of your openness and and, and just sharing your stories. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me on. I love this. Thanks, no problem. Everyone. It's been great. Allison, wait. I saw that you, ha you had your app. You had it. <laughs> I mean, I was just going to say the community app where people can text you directly. Oh, 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 yes. I've really loved being able to connect with people who have been following the content. So now I can learn their stories and who they are and also share like weekly affirmations or inspiration just to kind of keep that thread of positivity. So I think that's my favorite app so far. Otherwise I'm like, get the phone away from me. <laughs> phone away from me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> also so nice to see you all in Jordan. Hi. After so many years. Hey, so many, so many. I know I'm, I'm like staring at my phone, trying to be professional and not pick it up to like DM you real quick. I, everybody, <laughs> all of you guys be like, Hey, let's hook up when we so can. Say <laughs> I love it. Well, you guys, thank you again. This has been so wonderful. And I've learned a lot from all of you. I've learned a lot from you, Allison. <laughs> and I want to take that back. Parasocial. <laughs> yes, parasocial. Parasocial relationships. There are entire We're books ahead. written on it. Trust me, it helps okay. to be like, okay, there are names. Hi, I'm Zach Williams, and thank you for joining us. I'm a board member of Bring Change to Mind and a mental health advocate. I came to this work after I lost my father. I really struggled with his death. It is so important to talk about mental health and to end stigma. I encourage you to join us in having open and honest conversations about mental health. It can be simple. Ask a family member, friend, or neighbor how they are doing. Listen without judgment. Share your own story and be vulnerable. Everyone can be a part of this movement of change. Let's talk about mental health and save lives. Visit bringchangetomind.org to get involved. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for tuning in to Conversations with Bring Change to Mind on such an important topic. I'm Dan Wakeford, the Editor-in-Chief of People. Almost all of us know or love someone affected by mental illness or have dealt with it ourselves. Bring Change to Mind and People's Let's Talk About It initiative, which I launched in October 2019, is the perfect partnership because we share a common goal to destigmatize this sensitive topic, to provide resources about where to get help, and to offer support to help anyone in need. 
I believe in the power of storytelling, touching people's hearts and opening their minds. I wanted to shape our campaign around stories from regular folks as well as celebrities who have dealt with mental illness. People's alliance with the crisis text line has also helped hundreds in their time of need. If you or someone you know need mental health help, text STRENGTH to the crisis text line at 741741 to be connected to a certified crisis counsellor. Just talking about how you feel helps. In other words, saying let's talk about it can be a powerful first step to healing.